uh, Ermac Center. My name is Veselin Jungic and I'm a deputy director here. Uh, oh. Hi. So the main idea of the Ermac Center series SFU Research Masterclass is to have a group of prominent SFU researchers that will, instead of an academic lecture on their research topic, tell the story of their research path and the best practices and tips they learned along the way. Our today's guest is Mark Clear the, from the Department of History. His interviewer is Baharak Yousefi, the head librarian of SFU's Surrey Campus Library and, and a director on the board of the BC Libraries Cooperative. She received a Master of Arts in Women's Studies from SFU in 2003 and a Master of Library and Information Studies from UBC in 2007. Please join me in welcoming Mark and Bara. Thank you, Vessel. And um, I'll start with a bit of an official bio if you don't mind, just to set the stage. Uh, Mark Clear was born in Ladner, BC, and worked for several years at a number of jobs, including bridge tender, short order cook, dishwasher, construction laborer, printer, folk singer, first aid attendant before going to university. He served as a shop steward and contract negotiator with the Glaciers Union, and has been a members, member of the Carpenters Union, QP, and the TSSU. He received his PhD from Memorial University in 1992 and came to SFU in 1995. Since then, Mark has supervised student work on a range of topics, including, this was really hard to narrow down, they're all so interesting, workers and environmental issues, drag racing in the 1940s and 50s, representations of women in the Vancouver labor and daily press, Vietnam draft resistors in Canada, organizing BC restaurant workers in the 1930s to the 70s. Mark is the author of multiple books, including Where the Fraser River Flows, The Industrial Workers of the World in BC, Rebel Life, The Life and Times of Robert Gosden, Revolutionary Mystic, Labor Spy, Red Flags and Red Tape, The Making of a Labor Bureaucracy, and Bakunin, Creative Passion. Thank you for doing this with me today. Thanks for Mark, making it really. sound like I can't hold the job. <laughs> <laughs> that last day. Um, so Mark, you said uh, before we came that the, to uh, the title of our show today, I think that's what you called it, the show, should have been how a mild-mannered anarchist fell in with a bunch of historians right. um, <laughs> instead of the t uh, title yes. that we have. Why do you think yes. that should have been the title? It, well, it would be more accurate. I, I was interested in anarchism long before I came to university. Uh, it just, at an early age, just seemed to make an awful lot of sense to me. So I was working at, at as you pointed out, a number of jobs. <laughs> and, uh, um, and even as a, a kid growing up in a small town and a working class uh, family, the, well, we had no language for it. The reality of class was there every single day. Right? Um, and uh, it was in, always in a huge contrast to the rhetoric that uh, I heard in, as everyone did in schools, on television, whether it was watching the wonderful world of Disney on Sunday nights about, about democracy and freedom and equality and these wonderful stories of justice that rubbed up against the reality of working class life. And so for me, the, finding some way to bring those two things together I think is what started that. And it was also uh, a time when even as a, as a kid, uh, I was aware of uh, uh, the events of the 1960s. So Selma, for example. I was, I think, in grade eight at uh, the time of the Kent State Massacre and the Jackson State Massacre a few days after that. Uh, and and th those events, especially Kent State, given that I was a bit older, really showed for me the 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 contrast, that living contrast between the rhetoric and the reality of life in North America. That here were people engaging in protest and the government would shoot them. Right? That was hard to square with stories about Daniel Boone, for example, and Fathers of Confederation, the kinds of myths. And so trying to resolve those things, not in a very, you know, it's not like I was, you know, baby Chomsky or something like this, you know, pouring through this, but just the, the conflict uh, just had me interested in these kinds of questions, right? just that, in that kind of reality. Right. Mm -hmm. So the 
You've said that the themes of your research are essentially power and struggle and how people have fought to gain equality and more rights. And it seems that the arc goes way back. And you do sound like a bit, bit of a baby Chomsky, to be <laughs> fair, <laughs> yeah, to be able to kind of put those things um, up against each other, um, the disparity between. Um, that's the mild-mannered part. I spend okay. a lot of time reading okay. books, I think, right. when other kids right. were, you know. <laughs> and, uh, so may I ask what, um, so quite an early start in the, kind of the consciousness around these issues. And then can you take us a bit through about some of the later influences yeah. that came? Yeah, sure. Um, unlike, I didn't learn uh, much of the anarchism and, and theories and, and thought uh, at university. I did go uh, and worked at places. Uh, but it was a time uh, when there were an awful lot of people had gone through the 60s, right? were doing other kinds of things. They were working. And I got to hang out with some really brilliant uh, working class intellectuals. Right? Uh, people uh, like uh, Mark Warrior, uh, Star Rosenthal, some people in the library uh, world at SFU may, may remember. Um, interesting people, working people who understood these kinds of questions. And many of them have been active in the new left uh, in Vancouver. So Star Rosenthal had been a, a yippie you know, for a while and part of the, the Vancouver Liberation Front. And they'd gone through all kinds of struggles and issues. So they brought to this a real sophistication that I got to learn hanging out in the beer parlors. Right. Right? Right. After work, talking about, and people then planning, working within institutions, uh, not thinking that the, we were going to make the revolution, but to give each other support, ideas, and help uh, based on some anarchist principles, I think people like Chomsky would call these affinity groups. I'm not sure that we ever thought of it quite like that, but uh, uh, and that was a big part of it. And and it did mean that we uh, thought about things, read things, and people uh, for me that were extremely influential, uh, or people like Maurice Brinton, uh, or his real name was, was Christopher Pallas, who wrote uh, a, from a uh, he never called himself an anarchist because the anarchists that he bumped into uh, were, uh, what's the nice word for crazy, um, um, uh, engaging in practices that didn't seem they were about to build a mass movement. Let's put right. it that right. way. Right? Uh, but were much more kind of sectarian and uh, less uh, empowering in that kind of a way. Uh, but Brinton's work, and Brinton had come from the uh, the French and English left. He'd been a Trotskyist and had left that movement uh, and wrote some uh, powerful uh, works about uh, workers' control and workers' management. Uh, and, and that, to me, this pulled it together. This is how people get to have real freedom. Uh, the, the, the interesting thing about, about Marx, of course, is he gave us a way to think about the ways in which politics are shaped by economics. And you cannot look at them separately right uh, and and that and, and Brinton and others uh, took that and applied it to every other sphere of our life what are the the, the dynamics the relationships of power and domination in other words sex gender all these kinds of questions and, and so it was uh, uh, yeah, things that we that people talked about and did so uh, in the workplace right not just in the seminar room and that made a very big difference you know, because you are trying to, it's part of the reason uh, that we were involved in the labor movement, not because we thought that was the simple single answer. Uh, we kind of knew better. Um, and, uh, um, and I ended up writing a book about labor bureaucracy as a result of some of those experiences, but because that's where working people were, and those were institutions where we thought you could, you could do, you could have some chance at opening up space for people. One of the reasons why I'm just really thrilled to be here um, talking to you is this incredible harmony between the way you engage with your research, with your teaching, with your supervisory work, and the way you engage with the public. Um, as one of your former students, who may or may not be in the room right now, uh, has said that you were, you were even department chair in the same bandwidth as you are everything else. So the question. That's an is interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, let's it see. It is. It is indeed it? a compliment. So um, how do you do that? How do you make sure that the theories and ideologies that you've just described that influence your work as a historian also uh, play such a big part in 
you as a teacher, administrator, as like a human person? How do you, how is it so, <laughs> yeah. um, it's really has struck me in just the harmony, it's incredible. Um, well, I'm, I'm delighted that it looks that way. It doesn't <laughs> look that way from where I'm standing at all. Okay. It, it, looks, it looks much messier, I must say. I don't have a simple, you know, the 10 steps to being a, you know, a consistent anarchist, because in many ways I'm not, and, you know, and, and I'm also a very mild-mannered uh, uh, person, which many people would say means I can't be an anarchist at all. So, you know, uh, I don't, I don't I, that, that's gratifying to hear. I'm not sure it, I, it's deserved. In that, but I, but I get, but there are some some principles that I try to live to as best I can, and like everybody else, you know, it's life is about compromise and and doing these kinds of things. And and for me, it was a sense that that treating and being uh, this notion of equality always struck me as something really important uh, somehow. And of course, we we fail and we screw that up. Or 19, uh, 2015. Yeah, even before 2015, even these seem like important things. Yes, that's yes, that's okay. that's right, you know. Um, and and of course, the irony is I'm in a position now where I actually grade people. I literally tell them what what their work means, uh, and and that's something that I struggle with all the time. And it, and I do try to always find ways to teach. And I've learned from many of my students that what an authoritarian bastard, in fact, I am, despite the rhetoric and you know <laughs> writing about Bakunin. Um, so it's so. I I haven't solved it, you know, at all, you know, but they are the questions that still intrigue me uh, as a researcher, uh, which is what had me thinking about the IWW originally, which was a group of, you know, working class uh, 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 anarchists uh, who, in their preamble for 1905, starts off by saying the working class and the employing class have nothing in common. It seemed accurate to me. It seemed about, about right, you know. I'm always struck by the fact that uh, you can almost get away with throwing a pie in the face of the prime minister in this country. And you can, you know, walk up to the prime minister if you can, you know, get past the bodyguards. And if it's not Jean Chrétien, who will take you out himself. Uh, um, and call him any name you want. You can say anything that you want. And that's kind of okay. You cannot do that to your boss. Right? So again, that that contradiction, you know, between that so-called democratic space, which is much more limited, just because you can pie the prime minister, that's that's not what democracy is about. But you have a much broader range there. Not a bad place to start, but it's. A, um, uh, and and so the IWW grasped that, and made, and they also were extremely critical of. Uh, the uh, parliamentarians and the parliamentary process, seeing that as just another way in which economic power was wielded. Right? Um, and they wanted to organize working people. So part of me, the part of the work I wanted to do as a historian was to look at people who had tried this, to look for bits of hope. Rather than say, look, this is some kind of crazy idea I've invented. I'd like to call it participatory democracy or workers' control of industry. They say, no, it's something working people designed and figured out themselves right. a long right. time ago. Uh, and that's what, what started the first book. One of the things that I bumped into constantly working uh, uh, was that the trade union movement or the trade union leadership uh, was not composed of members of the industrial workers of the world, that it was pretty obvious that uh, as, at a certain level, uh, leaders in the, in the trade union movement have little interest in breaking down these barriers and these walls and, and about democracy. Some of them worked really hard to make sure their organizations were not very democratic. Um, and the IWW had a critique of that as well in 1905. You know, they talked about the trade unions today foster a state of events where we allow the system to continue. Right? So writing about them and looking at them in British Columbia was, that was part of what got me started uh, when I decided to, to do history work because it was an example of this that I thought that we could uh, learn from and, and build on. I wasn't sure I was going to ask this question, but I think you've just pushed me that way. So, I'll, so if we could talk about intersectionality in the labor movement a bit. Um, so currently, two of BC's largest unions are led by women. So the BC Fed by Irene Lanzinger and the BCGU, Stephanie Smith. On the other hand, um, out of the 22 officers listed on the BC Fed website, not a single Aboriginal or person of color. Um, so the question is, 
does the BC labor movement have a race and gender problem, or are things getting better for white women? <laughs> Options. <laughs> nice, nice dilemma, yes, thank you. I get gored on both cheeks on that one. <laughs> um, 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 let, let, me, let me first distinguish them between the labor movement and the labor leadership. Okay, great. Because these are two very different things. Right. right? Uh, and my relationship with the later, labor leadership is somewhat different. You know, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a contested one in many ways, right? Uh, and uh, there is no question, how, so I think a couple of things. One, I think that it is the case that the labor movement has done more for workers of color, workers, uh, uh, women workers, in every respect than any other organization in Canada, right? Uh, in terms of, of equality on the job, have they, do they have a lot further to go? Unquestionably, yes. Have they been marred by racism and sexism? Yes, and still, of course, are today. Nonetheless, uh, they have been the leaders in terms of actually uh, putting more money in people's pockets, giving them uh, chances to assert their dignity on the job without repercussions. So I think we need, so my critique of the labor movement has to always be qualified by yes. that. Right? Uh, the, the leadership question is something very different. I think uh, the, the, it is the case that that becoming a labor leader is a lot like becoming a university professor. In both cases, you study the working class to avoid being part of it. Um, and that is fraught with contradictions. The difference is they actually have some power to do things mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. uh, with that. One of the things that they have not done is examine themselves very carefully. Right. So I can tell you by the sales of my book about the labor bureaucracy that they ain't reading it. Right? <laughs> right. Uh, I hope they would buy it and then just you know then burn them all. They would buy it, but no, didn't even do that. They could simply they could ignore that. Right. But that's not who I wanted to do research and write for right. anyway. Right. right. So yeah, yeah, is there a problem there? A huge problem. But it's a problem that is going to be addressed by workers who are doing that everywhere, right? They are demanding more, and they are finding increasingly that they can do this outside of the official channels sanctioned by the leadership of the labor movement, right? So the BC Federation of Labor um, is not the vehicle that working people will use to do that. And it may be increasingly that their trade unions are not going to be the only place where they do that because they see that, that blockage at the top. Right. Um, a very uh, interesting old anarchist a fellow, his alias was Max Nomad, which is a great name, I think, for a, an anarchist writer who uh, uh, wrote several books of kind of lefty aphorisms. And uh, at one point, his, his critique of the Bolsheviks in the Soviet Union was that at a certain point, probably earlier in 1917 than we think, they changed the meaning of that powerful slogan, you know, all power to the Soviets, right, which was going to uh, put working people people in charge of factories, of, of the workplace, and of the politics. They changed that slogan from all power to the Soviets to all good jobs to party members. <laughs> right? they, you know, they, they changed the meaning of that. And that's true of the labor movement as well. Right? That's a critique that goes back to Samuel Gompers and the American Federation of Labor. Uh, and yeah, and that's part of what I mean. And again, comes from part of my experience. I worked at a you know, print shop, several print shops, and uh, a and, uh, group of us wanted to organize to join a union. We phoned up the International Typographical Union, which in those days was a huge, powerful union. And we talked to the business agent who said, you know, there's only 15 people in this unit. I said, yes, but we're solid and we're dynamic and our strength is, of each person is the strength of 10 because our hearts are pure. And he goes, yeah, yeah. yeah. But it's going to cost us $10,000 to organize you guys and we're never going to make that money in dues. It's really not a cost-effective proposition for us, right? Uh, and this was, it wasn't eye-opening because that was the critique that the IWW had made of Samuel Gompers and the, the American Federation of Labor, you know, who, they worked very hard to keep women and uh, uh, racialized people and, uh, you know, out of, of the unions. Uh, but to have it put that coldly was, was interesting, right? So these are the problems of the labor bureaucracy, right. which is very different than the problems that workers have, yeah. Um, you, you mentioned that um, that's not who you're writing for. So I wanted to ask you about, um, it's clear that the accessibility of your work is very important to you. 
Um, you write for the Thai, sometimes about vampires. You, <laughs> you have an IMDb page. You're active on Twitter. <laughs> you know, you, 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 um, you have a knack for saying things without jargon. Um, why is this um, accessibility of your work so important to you? Uh, I, probably because I can't understand most of the jargon <laughs> that I see and read out there, so I can't replicate it very well, you know. Um, um, it, you know, it also did seem important to me always to, to be able to try to produce work uh, that could be uh, read by the people who pay for it, that is working people. You know, uh, not all the work that I do is like that. I write stuff yeah. that says, you know, I mean, I write for shirk committees like everybody else does, and I, you know, and I write for promotion and these kinds of things. But the lovely thing about this job at this moment is that it does let me do some of both of those right. things. Right. Yeah, it's also part of the of the of the problem, though. I think that um, uh, that Marx talked about. He critiqued a, an anarchist named Proudhon, uh, and and said that you know Proudhon. Uh, in Germany is is regarded as a, a fine uh, French political economist and in France he is regarded as an excellent uh, interpreter of German philosophy but I can tell you as a German philosopher and political economist you know he is actually neither of those things so I kind of feel a bit like that that the academics might think I'm a good popular historian and maybe some people think I'm a good academic historian who never read that stuff so I try to navigate that as carefully as I can to, <laughs> to that best advantage <laughs> right. you you're um I don't know if inspiration is the right word, but um, you wrote Bakunin um, as a response to um, yeah. some of the, this kind of relates to your being a mild-mannered anarchist <laughs> that you've talked about, um, as a response to some of the um, characterization of um, him in the media after the uh, aftermath of yeah. the anti-globalization protests as the father of terrorism. Right. Is that, can you yeah. say more about that? Yeah, I'm, I'd always liked Bakunin. I mean, I, you know, I I like this, the stories of his life. This is a you know a, a almost literally larger than life figure. He was about six foot four and, and weighed probably three hundred pounds. At his uh, his heaviest, he had a beard. You know, the parallels are uncanny. He's a <laughs> time shorter, and, uh, you know, and uh, uh, and, uh, and unlike Marx, wrote in ways that people could understand. Right? So I uh, did not have the same kind of scientific rigor that Marx brought to these problems, but that's not always a bad thing. You know, you look at uh, Marx, and there's lots of algebra, which terrifies my students, even though. You know, it's like, and mm. me. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, me too. I just <laughs> fake it. Yeah. Uh, and, and Bakunin always wrote with an eye to mobilize people, right. to get them excited. So I always kind of liked him. And, and, and I liked that, that in, when, at a time when lots of people writing uh, history were you know, quoting Marx, I got to be able to say, actually, Bakunin had some interesting things to say about power as well. And, and to my mind, uh, more interesting things and more accessible things than people like Derrida and Foucault. Who were very much the rage, uh, you know, when I was in graduate school. Yeah, and I thought th these people have talked about these things long before the French decided to make it way complicated. <laughs> and uh, and, uh, and so I so I always kind of liked them, and, and I thought this was this was uh, inspiring. But in uh, at the events of 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 nine eleven, the, the not not the uh, 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 not the Chilean coup, of course, but the World Tower uh, nine eleven. Um, that's not funny. You know, I know. No, no. Uh, people. Uh, um, started wanting you know, to ask questions, but you know, where does this mindless terrorism come from? Right? Uh, that seemed to be to be not a very accurate description of the events of 9-11. Of, of but when they started saying things like, oh, well, we can take this back to the 19th century and Bakunin, the apostle of mindless terror. And I thought, well, that's just not right. I, I mean, I don't know a lot about Bakunin, but I know that's just plain wrong. Um, and, and then I started to, I wanted to write just a kind of a quick sort of popular book about this that would take me, you know, like maybe a year to, to do. It became a bigger project than that uh, because he was a much more interesting character than I'd even suspected, you know, in terms of the influences. This is, he uh, went to university in classes with people like Max Stirner and Soren Kierkegaard. And, uh, and Frederick Engels, uh, you know, he was part of, a, of an amazing group of, of educated people that went on to transform much of European thought. Uh, for lots of reasons, did not become a, a professional philosopher. Spent ten years in the Czar's prisons uh, instead, um, and it was clear that he has been constantly misinterpreted by uh, by. Uh, 
orthodox or middle mainstream historians who always ask that question, why is anarchism so darn nasty? And my experience was it's actually the most hopeful of political philosophies, right? This is the one that says, actually, we can get along and work together. We have some work to do to get there, uh, but it's possible, right? Uh, unlike most philosophies and political ideologies that say, nope, this is a human nature is in this guy. And it's not that the anarchists even think that we can be anarchists because we are good. Many of them say it's actually because we are Eh, kind of good and kind of bad that we want a world where institutions do not allow people to take power. You know, it's not just a sense of, oh, if we're all, if we're all so great people, you know, go to a department meeting. You'll, you know, it's like, you know, go to your strata council. You will not become a way a convinced anarchist. Uh, right? <laughs> we can all get along. But, but the, the, the crucial part is that that power allows some to dominate others, and that makes the whole thing ugly and terrible and, 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 and oppressive. So that was the Bakunin that I understood, the one that said these things. And so I started to write about that. Uh, and then really had to say, wow, I have to do a much bigger book because all of the accessible English books start from this assumption that anarchism is a terrible evil and we must explain this in terms of the uh, psychology of its adherents. So there were some, you know, it's a lot of, uh, of psycho, uh, historical analyses of Bakunin. And then I found that they did bad work. They would mistranslate mm. things, for example, right. you know, or they, you know, the, the quote that they used a lot, this is a banal example, but it was the kind of thing that sometimes historians get fixated on and start to follow through these little trails. Um, a, a famous, he was, in, uh, there's a letter that he wrote and he said, uh, uh, the translation usually given is, you know, I, I heard Beethoven's symphony play tonight and I felt like I could destroy the world. And I thought, yeah, okay, it's pretty exciting music. You know, I had the same reaction listening to the Stones, that, you know. I said, but, but it turns out that actually that, that he really meant something rather different from that, that it was, it was empowering, right? Uh, perhaps devour the world might be a better translation than destroy the world, you know? Uh, and these kinds of errors are repeated so often. I thought, okay, this is not going to be the short, down, and dirty book. This is going to be a long, <laughs> you know, task to do that. And so I spend less time in some ways talking about his actual ideas as an anarchist later. It's like to focus on trying to setting this story straight to understand that this is not uh, now, which is not to say there were not anarchists uh, of that other mold. And Bakunin actually worked with some of them, including a fellow named Nikayev, uh, who wrote something called the, the Revolutionary Catechism that starts off with this powerful phrase, the revolutionary is a doomed man, mm -hmm. uh, which inspired people like Eldridge Cleaver, for example, who is not necessarily a model of anarchist integrity. Um, um, but um, that connection has been played up, but it was a very short time that, that Bakunin had with him, and he broke with him decisively to, to offer a very different picture of anarchism than uh, something that looked anything like mindless terror or terror for the sake of terror. Right? He was not opposed to violence, but let's, let's be clear, the violence of the, of the ruling class dwarfs the violence of anarchists every single day. Right? In in terms of your writing of labor history, you've said that you um, like Harvey Kay's characterization of history against historians as consensus builders and for historians as social critics. Mm -hmm. Am I getting that yeah. correctly? Yeah. Um, can you say a bit more about that and how that yeah. idea impacts your own work? Yeah. Um, historians sometimes talk about presentism, and it has several different meanings, but when they use it in its most negative way, they would like to say things like historians should not uh, bring the views of today and apply them you know, to the past, that we shouldn't judge uh, historical figures by the, uh, the points of, of today. And to some degree, that's, you know, there's, there's an argument there. Um, it's not an argument that I want to carry very far, though. So, you know, so, people, so the question often arises in Canadian history, uh, you know, was Johnny MacDonald a racist? And people will say, well, you know, by the, the standards of his day, he had a fairly you know, liberal attitude towards uh, to First Nations peoples. It's not like any of his friends were, but, you know, I mean, there were some really virulent people uh, in those days, and that wasn't him. And my response is usually something like, and yet the genocide happened and he was in charge and he sent the Mounties out there to further this project of economic empire. Okay, if you don't want to call that racist, uh, you know, <laughs> you know, 
know, <laughs> fine, you know. Uh, but so for me, I don't know what, for me, and many people in my department and the person would, would disagree. I, I don't know for me what the point of doing history would be if it were not to give people some ways to challenge right. the present, yeah. right? to look at the, I mean, I think everyone does use the past to draw lessons, even if it's like, you know, ouch, stove is hot. It's kind of a historical lesson, right? Uh, and so the history that we are taught in schools, uh, it varies a lot. There are lots of really good teachers there, but they have been increasingly constrained in the choices of textbooks and th things like um, uh, learning outcomes in the K-12 system, which couldn't happen here, <laughs> um, um, constrained in what they can teach and how they can teach it. So some people make it through and some teachers do very good work despite all of right. that, right? Yeah. But the idea that history could actually be grasped by people and used to say, look, we can do things differently. Right? Just because George Brown declared uh, at the time of Confederation that it is an empire we have in mind, it doesn't mean that Canadians have to be bound by that, <laughs> right? Most of them were excluded by that in the first place, of course. Uh, moving ahead, yeah, so the idea of writing history that lets people say, you know, the, there are moments when people have stood up mm -hmm. and fought back. And that's part of the reason I have such great graduate students who do all kinds of work. I mean, I haven't yet had someone that wants me to supervise something on Spartacus. Uh, uh, the, none, of, none of the languages which I could possibly read, but if they came, I'd be, you know, I'd be excited. We'd have to get people like Emily O'Brien to help with the, you know, with the source material, but, uh, um, um, because that's, yeah, and, and so I'm always inspired by their work We've, because they come in and this is the kind of thing they want to do to say, look, we can do better right. and I can use the past to figure out ways, some ways to start doing that. And part of it's by giving back people the history that they've created, which is why I started to do uh, labor history, right? um, to try to give people, the working people, some sense of that. I heard you um, quote Utah Phillips. I'm going to read the quote that I've heard yeah. you quote. The long memory is the most radical idea in this country. It is the loss of that long memory which deprives our people of that connective flow of thoughts and events that clarifies our vision, not of where we're going, but where we want to go, which is related to what you were just saying. What about this quote speaks to you? Why do you? Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I quote it because I couldn't say it any better <laughs> myself. You know, it's a, I think it does sum it up. Uh, really well that, that we, uh, our history does give us all kinds of opportunities that show us that the present was made. Right? There was nothing inevitable about it, that it was fought for, it was fought over. Right? And, and we are still fighting that bigger fight. Right? It's not so much that we want to replicate the, the world of 19th century anarchists or the Spanish anarchists of the Civil War, but uh, they are on our side. Uh, in, in some ways as we deal with these questions and problems. And I don't think we can just simply read their manifestos and say, yeah, let's do that. But we can be inspired by, by their lessons. They do have much to teach us because they, do, they did fight uh, over many of the same kinds of questions that we do. But things have changed a lot and some of the basics have not changed. And yeah, that, that important memory of you know, wh why, why do we do what we do? Right? And if it's not for that picture of a, of a better world, um, that's sad, because <laughs> you know, there are lots of people out here that are that are very that are quite content with the way the world is. Right? Uh, for all of the uh, hope and promise that Justin Trudeau has brought uh, uh, to many of our hearts, he did, did remind us that it is 2015. You know, but workers' control of industry uh, and participatory democracy are not on that list. And, and while I'm heartened by his comment that you know that this will be the last first past the post election, I did think, well, that just means he doesn't want to have any more elections, right? <laughs> you know? it's, it's, that's not quite enough, but you know. So yeah, lots to be done. Speaking of Justin Trudeau and the long memory, recently on election night, he confused at least half the nation when he said, sunny ways, my friend, sunny ways. Um, <laughs> this is what positive politics can do. Right. Um, is he being radical there, Mark? Oh, I think he's. Uh, my interpretation of this was it was very much in the in a long-standing Canadian tradition, which is if you take strong stands on issues, you won't stay in power very long, right? So the so the reference, of course, is to is to Wilfrid Laurier, right, who would tell the story of the contest between the the wind and the sun. They have a bet over who could take the coat from a man, 
He was walking down the street, and the wind blew and blew and blew, and the man just held the coat tighter. The sun came out, and the sun smiled on the man and beamed on the man and warmed the man up to the point where he took the coat off himself. So in some ways, it's kind of an evil metaphor about manipulation, you know? <laughs> you know it's, we can get what we want without beating people up. We can, you know, it's a, people like Gramsci, I think, talked about this kind of thing, <laughs> if I'm not mistaken, right? Having said that, I think it's, it's I'd rather have the son than, you know, than, <laughs> you know, and the son of Pierre, you know, than, uh, uh, than the alternative, right. you know, because it does give people more space. I think that one of the, the, the tragic things of, of the Harper government has been the way in which it did shut down debate, even the ability of reporters to ask questions right, uh, uh, in ways that I think alarmed and surprised people. Right? Uh, I, I do not think the election means the millennium has come, uh, but we, you take what you can get when you get it and start there. Right? Um. In terms of your uh, grad students and the kind of research they've brought to you and they do with you, um, what do you think about kind of Marxism and pro it's not, pro it's, would you say it's not a growing field of study currently? It's not the most fashionable thing. So what is your advice to your students who both want to study Marxism and also want to get jobs. <laughs> How do you? <laughs> right. Uh, given my own spotty <laughs> career record, I'm not sure I'm in a position to give anybody <laughs> advice on uh, on jobs and and how to do that. Um, and but but I mean what I I do tell them is that that it's it's pretty it will be very clear to people in a job interview if they are trying to back away from things that they believe and think about right. and that their best. Uh, their best move is to say what they what they mean and mean what they say, and take the consequences. In my experience, um, there is not the same kind of blacklisting of Reds that we saw in the 1950s. You know, uh, uh, that may speak to the sunny ways of the university as opposed to the, the blustery wind of, of other workplaces. But you know, but nonetheless, um, and. And uh, part of my difficulty is that, that w while the Wikipedia page that I did not write about, uh, that, that is about me, uh, uh, calls me a Marxist, I'm not sure that Marxists would think that that's accurate. Um, <laughs> and so my response is, when people ask me if I'm a Marxist, I have to say, well, why don't you tell me what you think that means, and I'll tell you if that's what I am <laughs> you know, or not. Um, uh, so well, I, I teach a course on on, on Marx, um, uh, it's one of the you know, many different things that I, I, I guess I do uh, on here. It's largely because he does give us, as I said earlier, that vocabulary to understand that whatever happens in the political sphere is not restricted to that, that it is not, you cannot uh, simply look at politics and political thought without understanding the economic society that they came from. It's no accident. Whatever you think about the brilliance of Aristotle, right? one of the things that he didn't do was write a blistering critique of slavery. Right? Uh, as far as I know, I stand to be corrected by other people here. Right? That, 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 that is just taken for granted. Right? So Stephen Harper, uh, on, the, on the anniversary of, of Johnny McDonald's birth, wrote an article in the newspaper where he said, you know, Johnny McDonald was not just a uh, dynamic and exciting and, and clever politician, he was also a gifted political thinker. He took with him, for example, all of the works of John Locke to the Charlottetown Conference. And my thought was, wow, you know, who knew? Johnny MacDonald, you know, read English political philosophy. And then I thought, right, and this is the same John Locke that said things like, if indigenous people aren't using the land in the ways that we define and understand, they don't have a right to it, right? Or the John Locke who said, the only things that you have a right to are the things that you create with your own labor. I'm thinking, that sounds pretty great. Or the labor you can hire, uh -huh. <laughs> right? You know? Uh, right, so so I uh, that and that so uh, I think uh, uh, Stephen Harper's line made a great deal of sense. Except that when we usually think about Canadian history, uh, laws of history, we think of only of it uh, moving forward these political ideals without any reference to the to the economic side. And that it is the understanding of, of economics that explains what happens to First Nations peoples, right? how the labor uh, of women becomes plugged into a giant 
uh, project, the unpaid labor of women, becomes part of this project of empire. Right? If you just look at the rhetoric, they all sound great. Right? Um, the reality, though, is this makes it, means we have to look at it. And that's the sense in which I guess people would say I'm a Marxist, to insist on looking at that layer, to peel that back and just say, you know, it's not just about great political ideals. Right? love to keep doing this, but I also have a watch here that I'm, I want to give people an opportunity to ask questions. But I will ask one last question. I want to hear about your current research work or what's next for you. Okay. Yeah, I guess I'd have to start by saying that the first thing I have to do is acknowledge that research, when you, you, know, when you talk about things that we do, you know, we've done this, we could talk, uh, we always neglect to mention the, the colossal failures. Right? Uh, so one of the things that I've done in the last while is to give up on a project about writing about Marx, for example. Right? Yeah, yeah. So I was, and I'd done a lot of work on the book, which I will now you know, salvage and turn into course materials, this kind of thing. But a project that at the end of the day, I thought, I don't actually have anything that new to say or in interesting ways to say it, right? So that was kind of depressing, but also liberating. I, I then wanted, to, I started to do some work on a, pro, on a large project on uh, what the folk, uh, uh, folklorist Archie Green has called labor lore, the kinds of stories that you hear in the labor movement. Uh, they're kind of like urban legends, but they're the kind of, of uh, the hidden ideologies often of movements, just as urban legends are. They tell us something not about the actual story, but the, the you know. Um, and one of my favorites was a story that was, was told in British Columbia as early as 1912 about Italian navvies uh, in the 1880s digging the trenches to lay pipes uh, from Capilano watershed to Vancouver. So they're digging the trenches you know, for the growing city of Vancouver. And they went on strike for a 10% raise. And their strike was broken. And at the, the campfire on the night before they went back to work, they realized they had lost. And the Italian uh, navvies then filed 10% off the blade of their shovels. So they would, they would move 10% less dirt every, every day. Right? Great story about initiative and, you know, and a direct action approach to labor uh, negotiations and issues. But it didn't actually happen. Right? It, was a, it was an example of this labor lore. Right? Um, and I thought about collecting stories mm -hmm. like that and did some work around that and then realized that lots of it was going to mean sitting in rooms with lots of uh, uh, old retired officials of the labor movement who mostly wanted to talk about how awesome they were. Uh, and that got depressing very fast. <laughs> you know? so, uh, so that's not something I'm doing either. <laughs> that's, you know. <laughs> and I mentioned that just so I have the list of what you're yeah, not right, doing. Yeah, right. So that's a big, getting to be a bigger and bigger list. So uh, uh, two things that I'm working on yes. right now, and one is um, uh, a history of Canada. Um, I don't want to call it a people's history, although I love you know Howard Zinn and and people uh, like Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz, who just spoke here recently and wrote a book called "The uh, Indigenous People's History of, of America." But th the idea would be to give people uh, a kind of um, uh, what an, an art, a different narrative arc mm -hmm. for Canadian history, and I say that from, it comes from from my teaching, where many of my students, the ones that have been to you know, high school in British Columbia, know tons about the Komagata Maru. They know lots about Japanese internment, and they can still say, "And well, mistakes were made. We've learned that lesson. We've solved that problem, <laughs> right?" And but I was inspired by, by my niece who's studying Canadian history and asking me for help because she's a science kid. No one knows where those genes came from. But, uh, um, and she said, you know, so we've been, we've been studying about Canada at war. And, and I don't know, but it seems to me like no matter what happens, like the whole lesson is, but we were valiant fighters. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, yeah, that's pretty much what it is about. You know, it doesn't exactly glorify war, but nobody ever says that the, they, will, they will say that the First World War was a terrible, it was awful, it was horrible, and now we're going to Afghanistan. Right? So to try to link these things up to give people that sense and say, actually, that lesson needs to be relearned right? um, is part of what I want to do with that. And, and the other thing I'm working on is, is to, again, take a look at uh, the labor movement in British Columbia in a period that's really been ignored, uh, which is the 1920s. Uh, so people will write, uh, write up to the First World War. And with the exception of, of one thesis by Dale McCartney, who's here today, ignore what happens during the war. And then 1919, this wave of strikes across Canada. 
Uh, and then nothing happens until the 1930s when the communists come up. But what in fact happens is that after that strike wave of 1919, the labor movement retrenches. Right? It, it purges the left. Right? Uh, it goes after those radicals that helped to spawn that, that, that strike wave and put all kinds of different questions on the table. And that to me seemed like an interesting parallel and parable perhaps for our time. So, Looking thanks. forward to it. Thanks. Hi. Hi. Um, that was very entertaining <laughs> and uh, educational. Um, so I, I might be stating this too strongly, but um, it sounded like you were saying that <coughs> as a historian, you look at the past to inform the present and even to make a positive effect on the world. And I spent a sabbatical two years ago, and there was a bunch of historians, and I spent a long time trying to beat them into admitting that they do that. And they <laughs> seemed very reticent to admit that. So that kind of, w were you saying that? And yeah, I'm on your yeah. side on this one. Yeah, right. <laughs> I guess I would yeah. say among the other historians, yeah. would that be? Um, uh, it depends on which historians. You know, I'm, I'm in a department where my view is hardly the outstanding. You know, I mean, it's not, I'm not an outlier there. That people do all kinds of fabulous work in this department, right? Uh, and it depends on what level of history that you look at and, and who's doing it. Um, I think that uh, if if your historians are mostly from the United States, that might make a difference. Um, that there's a more a larger number of them. But I mean, the historical business has always been divided. You know, between people that think this should be a well, no. Let me let me rephrase this. I think, and again, I'll ask if Emily can help me out here. The Dionysius of Halicarnassus wrote that that history is the teaching of moral philosophy with examples, something like that. I think, and I think that's true. Now, I believe Dionysius wanted to say so. Therefore, you should all be good citizens of the Roman Empire and shut the hell up, right? <laughs> with his particular views on that. But it, so this is a very old-fashioned view, but it's one that I hold. It's just that we differ on what we think about things like slavery and the empire. On there, I think historians always do that. The weird thing about small L liberal historians is that they they kind of represent the mainstream, and so their views don't seem uh, challenging or odd, but they are just as uh, loaded in that sense. Right? So I had a student that said to me, so just because someone doesn't play left wing or right wing, that doesn't mean that Gretzky as a center doesn't have a position. <laughs> right? <laughs> Right, he does, right? Uh, he absolutely has one, but it's a position that, that uh, doesn't require you to do much in that sense, right? And it's a position that, that does kind of make the status quo seem normal and okay. Right? So a lot of historians are, are okay with doing it. It's not surprising, right? This is, uh, especially as uh, somebody's reflected that universities themselves don't have a history. The history of university is you know, the, the history of the society that it's in. And so those views that reflect kind of what the people in charge are kind of OK with, it's not surprising that some of that happens. As I say, our department is, I think, an outlier uh, in, in that way. It's that everyone there has some sense that this is about commenting on the present and perhaps building a future, too. But again, that's not unique to historians of the left. Is working class, hmm. but uh, is the working class, as you remember from your childhood, <laughs> and the working class that you are witnessing now, is that the same? Can you use the same term? Is that the same mm -hmm. idea? It, yeah, I think that uh, th that that the work that people do has changed often, and in some ways not. Right? I mean, it's still, and um, there are still something like 1,200 Canadians a year who die on the job. Right. So the, the fact that the working class is changing in terms of it, that, that's not news. I mean, people think that the service sector uh, has changed the idea of the working class. But when Marx wrote Capital, the largest single occupational category in England was domestic service. Right. So the service economy, is, that's, that's, that's not so new. If by working class you mean people who have to sell their labor right, to someone else uh, and 
as a result, do not have the opportunity to develop themselves fully and to de work and develop their potential, then I think, yeah, class is absolutely crucial to understanding that. It is also the case in Canada, for example, that the single biggest predictor of your health outcomes is a question your doctors never ask, which is, how much money do you make? Right? That you could, at every $10,000 bracket, you, as it goes up, you find appreciably better health outcomes. Uh, and that, uh, according to the, the surveys that have been done in Canada, is a better indicator of your longevity than whether you smoke or not. That, to me, is an astounding statistic in a country like this. So I think that class, absolutely. Uh, the working class has never been the, the caricature of uh, uh, rough, tough, hard to bluff men working, well, pounding metal. It's always been a very small part of work. You know, uh, and you know, I never, never worked as a logger. Right? I've never been down in a mine. Uh, uh, that doesn't mean that, that work does not have a huge impact on people's lives. Um, Mark, you talked about the economic implications, and, every, and I'm just thinking there's been a lot on social media about Trudeau and yay Trudeau in 2015 and yippee. And then um, a professor friend of mine posted, sorry for the not sounding super intelligent here, I'm just a communications person, but um, <laughs> someone posted on Facebook today about the purse strings are still being held by the white men, regardless mm -hmm. of this cabinet that he's elected. Mm -hmm. um, could you speak a little bit more about that and keep in mind that whatever you say I'm going to post on Facebook? Thank you. <laughs> I think we're out of time. <laughs> uh, well, I think that that's true. I would, I would go a bit further and to say that if the purse strings were held by a very small group of, of rich people, regardless of, of race or gender, it would still not make much difference to most people. Right? So, uh, well, I think it's great that the cabinet is, is a gender uh, you know, I mean, how bad should we feel that some men who are completely unqualified no longer can get jobs in the federal cabinet, uh, right? <laughs> that's, that's not a tragedy. Uh, it is also a long way from empowering people, you know, as, uh, that is to say the vast majority of people who do work for someone else, who bear uh, the marks of that uh, with them, both in terms of, of the, the, the death toll, the health outcomes, and the psychological impact that that has. Right? Uh, the fact, uh, again, I'll come back to the, to the point I made earlier, the fact that, that we have at least the ideal of a certain kind of rough political democracy is completely uh, rendered irrelevant the minute you cross the threshold into the workplace. Right? There is not even the pretense, none of the, chart, none of the rights in the Charter of Rights apply to you in the workplace. They are only about you and the government. And, and we know those Charter Rights are violated regularly and, uh, and uh, uh, do not give the protections, even the, the muted protections they're supposed to give. But they, don't, they simply don't apply in the workplace. And then that to me seems crucial. So I didn't expect that to change, not with him, not with Thomas Mulcair. And, uh, uh, not even with the Communist Party of Canada, Marxist-Leninist, uh, uh, right? <laughs> um, I'm probably the only one that I want to thank you for, I, I think, what some of the nice things you said about public education, at least in the past, at least before I retired. <laughs> but uh, I've uh, been doing some research into my great-great-grandmother, who was uh, the first doctor, female doctor in Britain, and uh, I was actually contacted about 15 years ago by a retired professor uh, at the hospital where that she helped to found with uh, Garrett Anderson. And uh, I came up here after I retired looking to do a master's degree. And, and in talking to some of the academics up here, I found that it kind of would have narrowed my focus, I guess. Mm. So I'm, I don't know if I'm writing a popular history or, or doing... Um, uh, will do justice to her, but I, I, uh, I found her to be a fascinating person that, that uh, uh, married another doctor that had uh, a horrible time getting her, uh, her degree from Zurich, accepted by uh, the academic community, the doc medical community in Britain, and then marrying another doctor. He passed away from tuberculosis, I believe, and then she became a social activist and became involved. Uh, she uh, 
uh, lived in South Africa, she lived in India, she toured in the United States, she spoke at the first International Race Congress on, uh, to dispel uh, preconceived ideas of col people of color and uh, champion women's rights. Um, I, I, I don't know, I, I think the biggest reason that I came here today was I was feeling like I was kind of at a wall. And I don't even know exactly what you said today, but it, it's kind of helped me move ahead and, and give me some new perspective. I think part of it is uh, I was disenchanted by some of her thoughts and thought, how could, how could this progressive thinking person believe some of those things? Um, anyway, I just want to thank you for uh, giving me a little inspiration to carry on. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, that comment actually raised, so reminded me of something I, wa I wanted to ask you for a while, which was, um, you know, as someone who comes from a background of social history, you've written two biographies now. <laughs> um, what do you make of that tension between, like, something like Bakunin kind of standing in for a history of anarchism? Is mm -hmm. that problematic? Is there another way to approach this? Do you think about that when you're, when you're approaching your research? Yeah, and, and a couple of people that I did graduate seminars with as a student pointed out that, you know, that you used to talk a lot about how biography was a completely reactionary way to do history. And I said, yeah, well, you know, one makes mistakes. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you know? I'm not sure which is the mistake on here. But it was something I was absolutely conscious of, right, to do that. But part of it, too, um, was that I... Uh, I wanted to write histories that some other people other than the, you know, the nine people on the tenure committee <laughs> you know, might read. Uh, and, that, and that biography remains a very popular uh, form of history. And, and I thought that I could use it as a way to open up debates and questions. So I will say in, I guess I'm saying it in my defense, that, the, that my book on Bakunin does not talk a lot about Bakunin's life. Uh, e. H. Carr wrote a fabulous book where you can literally discover what Bakunin was wearing on the day he went for lunch with Turgenev. That kind of detail, you know. Um, uh, he wore blue, the Germans wore gray, you know, as the line from Casablanca sort of goes. Um, and uh, the, um, but because I wanted to focus on the ideas and to think about the ways in which these ideas evolved and were challenged and were used by people to ask questions. Uh, the, that, that people ask all the time, and other, you know, when is violence an appropriate response to a political situation? Right? That's a huge question that we all think about. What does violence even mean? Right? Uh, what is the violence of the state and of, of capital compared to the violence of, of political extremists? You know, how to, so it was a way to, to try to engage those kinds of questions right? rather than just tell the story of his life. Uh, and the same was true of, the, of my biography of, of Robert Gosden, uh, who was a, a member of the Industrial Workers of the World, who advocated sabotage and then became a, a, a spy for the RCMP during 1919, you know, spying on his and uh, a drop in the dime on his comrades. Um, and one reviewer actually explained to me why I wrote that book. He said this was a book that, that tried to explain the phenomenon of Republican Democrats, working class re republic, sorry, of working class Democrats who voted for Reagan. Right? To look at the, at the anger uh, and the social situation of people whose lives are, are up against it. Right, in ways that at university we often don't even see in terms of our academic work up here. Uh, and it was a way to remind people of that and to, to say in some ways, to, to address your point, that people who respond and push and fight back are not always pure. They are not always perfect. Uh, there is a large anti-Semitic streak in Bakunin's work, for example. You know, uh, and. These people are not perfect, just as uh, we're not perfect. It doesn't mean that we can then get to say, well, because of X, we can simply ignore this. That there's some, there are things to unearth and things to, and things to learn from, from that. So I would say, yes, at some theoretical level, I would agree that writing biography is essentially a reactionary genre that, 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 that minimizes the, you know, but uh, it depends on partly how you do it and for what purpose. So I think that the, the left, for example, could do really well to write good left-wing biographies of people like Johnny McDonald. That would be interesting in ways to make us think differently about the past rather than every day in every way we're getting better and better. 
Thank you, Baharak. Let us thank our oh, thank you. Thank you. There are refreshments outside, and uh, our next master class is in two weeks. And Richard Lockhart from Statistics will be our guest. Thank you so much. Thank you.